What up guys, Joey Keen here, and in this video, I'm just kind of coming back. It's been about a month since I posted the last video uh, to this channel, and um, a little bit's happened since then, but I kind of wanted to go through and uh, just, uh, well, the first thing I wanted to do was I just finished the St. Macrina course, uh, which is a course I, it was run through the Diocese of the Midwest, and uh, it was about a year and a half long course uh, for the diaconate, so I could um, technically now go on to uh, take class, uh, uh, do some preparation to become a deacon. I don't currently plan to do that, but uh, that was one of the things that you could do with the class. So I, each class required us to write a paper, and the one that I chose was to write on the ways that the Eastern Church uh, viewed the papacy versus the way that the Western Church views the papacy, which, as you might know, is, is very different. Um, so uh, the, the church in general, the, the, church, the Christian church, it uh, you know, began on the day of Pentecost. Um, I mean, maybe you could say it occurred before that at the resurrection. I, I don't know how, how we decide exactly when it began, but definitely Pentecost is, is a major part of the foundation of the church. And um, for the first thousand years, there was one united church. And then at that thousand year mark, the church, um, you know, was separated into East and West. So the, the Western churches became known as the Catholic Church and the churches of the East became known as the Orthodox Church. And then later on, after the Protestant Reformation, the Western Church broke into many, many other parts. Um, but that's kind of a general overview. So there were a few criticisms that I got back about the paper uh, that I wanted to talk about uh, first. Um, my, my teacher responded saying, hello, dear Joachim, all is well. Because I, I always ask him, I hope you are well uh, when I send the papers. So he said, I hope uh, that it is with you as well. I read the paper and enjoyed it. So there's no need to rewrite. Um, here are some general comments. If we, if we don't do well on the paper, we have to rewrite it. So I at least did well enough that he didn't make me rewrite the paper. Um, he said, you steer away from the topic of papacy and spend too much time on the split in general or on other topics of the split, such as the filioque. So the paper could be more focused and could go into more details on the papacy. I did mention I had several typos. Uh, since I'll be reading the paper to you, you may not catch those and hopefully I'll edit them as I go. And then the third criticism, he says, include books specific on the topic of the papacy, such as the famous book by Meyendorf. Uh, so I did actually quote Meyendorf in this paper, but um, he did have a, a book that was specific to the papacy that I did not use, so that would have been helpful. Um, but uh, for this rest of this video, I'm just gonna read this paper and hopefully, um, if you enjoy the topic, you'll, you'll get something out of it. So uh, it does just focus on the view. I tried to be very unbiased in my approach to it and uh, not to focus on um, why or, or make a case for anything. I just simply stated how, how the different churches viewed it. So um, the text that I used for this book, I'm gonna go to the end so that I can find those. Um, Church History, The Basics, an abridged edition of The Church from Age to Age by Engelbrecht and Amp Klaus. Um, the Orthodox Church, an introduction to Eastern Christianity by Timothy Ware. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Eastern Orthodox Christianity by McGuckin. And The Blackwell Companion to Eastern Orthodox Christianity by Perry. Um, so I guess I didn't use my endorf. Um, we have read several of his texts for, for the class on Byzantine theology, it's excellent reading. Um, so I, I thought I had mentioned it, but I guess I guess that didn't make the paper. But okay, from a modern Western perspective, I'm, I'm reading the paper now, so just, just so you're aware. From a modern Western perspective, it can at times seem like a difficult and complicated view when attempting to look at the Christian church and understand why there are so many different groups within Christianity that all seem to have different understandings of what Christianity teaches and what is understood to be the church. If one were to look back at the annuals of time and attempt to trace Christ the Christian family tree, they would soon encounter the Protestant reformers at a time when Christianity broke into dozens of factions. For many Western people, the tendency would be to view the Protestant reformers as heroes because it is in line with the modern American idea of individualism and being different. Yeah. 
In some ways, a good argument can be made from a strictly Western view in support of the Protestants when considering that the Roman Catholic Church also saw many reforms beginning prior to Luther and including Catholic reforms in Spain and Italy with the Jesuits, papal reformation in the Renaissance popes, including Leo X, Adrian VI, and Clement VII, the Roman Inquisition, and the Council of Trent. While these two views of the church represented the majority of the church in the West, this did not represent the entirety of Christendom. The Eastern Church, which we know today as the Orthodox Church, also comprised a major part of the Christian Church as it continues to today. If we continued to look back further into the past, we would see a time centuries before the Reformations and the Catholics and Protestants to a time when the Church was still one Church in communion between East and West. Among the many areas of difference that separated the Eastern and Western churches, the views of the papacy are often at the center of what ends up separating them. The purpose of this paper will be to look at the conflicting views of how the West came to view the Patriarch and the Bishop of Rome, compared to how the East and the Eastern Patriarchs saw themselves as well as the Roman Pontiff. While there are many areas of difference that arose between East and West in the centuries of the first millennium after Christ's resurrection, it is these views of the Roman Pontiff that are at the center of the split between East and West, which culminate in formal excommunications in the year 1054. In the Orthodox way, then Father Timothy Ware, now he's known as Callistos Ware, notes that Orthodox Christians share, along with Roman Catholics, in the belief that there is a special place among the five ancient patriarchal apostolic seats for the Bishop of Rome. However, where our argument parts ways, as Ware states, the Orthodox Church does not accept the doctrine of papal authority set forth in the decrees for the Vatican Council of 1870 and taught today in the Roman Catholic Church. But at the same time, Orthodoxy does not deny the Holy and Apostolic See of Rome a primacy of honor, together with the right, under certain conditions, to hear appeals from all parts of Christendom. Note that we have used the word primacy and not supremacy. Orthodox regard the Pope as the bishop who presides in love, to adapt a phrase of St. Ignatius. Rome's mistake, so Orthodox believe, has been to turn this primacy or presidency of love into a supremacy of external power and jurisdiction. End quote. This represents the modern distinction between East and West. But as we will see, this distinction began not only a millennium prior to our modern circumstance, but centuries before the events of 1054. The schism between the East and Western churches was not one isolated event, rather it was the product of growing separation centuries before and after 1054 AD. Geographical, geographical proximity is one major factor that shaped the way the Eastern Church looked towards their patriarchs and emperors versus the way the Western Church would regard the Pope. In the East, the Patriarch of Constantinople never developed an independent office as something separate from the other Patriarchs and powerful Emperors. According to Engelbrecht and Klaus, the West developed very differently in this regard. And I quote, The Patriarch Bishop of the West, the Pope of Rome, had no real rival counterparts in the West. His bishopric, bishopric inherited both the ancient glory of the Church of Rome with its claim to a link with the Apostle Peter and much of the prestige and responsibilities of Imperial Rome after the Emperor had left for the East. With the Emperor far away, the Roman Patriarch could usually act independently of the Emperor. Most of the smaller bishops and other clergy as well as the population looked to him for leadership and help. The various barbarian chieftains and kings recognized the prestigious nature of his venerable office. Moreover, the papal office was occupied by several remarkable men culminating in Gregory the Great at the end of our period. The Western Church and society for several centuries found their natural leaders in the Roman popes." End quote. 
while iconoclasm may not have directly influenced the view of the church towards the Roman pontiff, it did provide an underlying vehicle to shape many facets of what would later come. During the 8th century, while Constantinople was in a period of iconoclasm, the Western popes had rejected any such view towards icons. Because of the iconoclastic period in the East, Pope Stephen would be forced to look towards Frankish rulers rather than their Christian brothers in the East. This would begin a relationship between the Western Romans and the Franks that would lead to, in the year 800, Pope Leo III crowning Charlemagne as emperor of the Roman Empire. This event was not accepted with any legitimacy by the Byzantine East, and Charlemagne's coronation was viewed as an act of schism within the Roman Empire. Ware refers, refers to this view as the monarchy of the Pope, end quote. Another major area that fueled the growing chasm of the views towards the papacy between the East and the West was the topic of the filioque. While this matter did not deal specifically with the papacy in a direct way, it did deal another blow to unity between the East and the West, and was among the divisions that brought an estrangement. McGuckin 2011 writes on the topic of the filioque that the single most vexed theological issue dividing Greek East and Latin West referring to referred referring to the addition of the word filioque which means and from the sun to the creed of Nicaea Constantinople 381 to denote the Latin church's doctrine of the eternal procession of the holy spirit from the father and the son this doctrine of double procession is rooted in Latin patristic sources, above all St. Augustine, from whom it served to affirm divine unity. In the West, during the time of Pope Leo III, during his early era, you, uh, unequivocally condemned the addition of the phrase to the ancient creed. He did recognize the doctrine that it represent, that being that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. In the East, however, St. Photius would propose an uncompromising monopatronism, monopatronism uh, the monarchy of the Father. Actually, I'm not sure if that's exactly how that refers to... We would say, I think, just to sum up monopatronism, um, that would mean like the way that we as Eastern Orthodox Christians would understand that would mean that the both Christ is is uh, begotten of the Father and the Holy Spirit comes from the Father, and and I'll not say anything more about it beyond that because I don't write about it in the paper, so I'm just free talking now. So back to the paper, uh, Photius considered the filioque to be heretical, and following an encyclical letter to the other Eastern patriarchs in which he denounced the statement, he summed he summoned a council in Constantinople. Constantinople where he declared Pope Nicholas excommunicate. This would not last long as Ignatius was restored to the Patriarch of Constantinople and restored union with Rome. For two centuries that followed this period, there were no outward expressions of schism. However, the underlying teachings and considerations that separated the East from the West were still present and would again come up when given the opportunity. The conflicts which had previously been the subject of schism and had still been brooding below the surface for two centuries came to a head in the year 1054 when Michael Corralarios, <laughs> Patriarch of Constantinople, and Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida had an exchange of excommunications from the church which resulted in the event that we now refer to as the Great Schism. Humbert had been sent to Constantinople by the Pope with the goal of gaining an ally against the Normans as well as dealing with the complaints of the East regarding Western customs being unorthodox. After a series of unsuccessful negotiations, on July 16th, Humbert entered Hagia Sophia, attempting to place a bull of excommunication on the altar against Patriarch Michael and his followers, citing their many crimes and errors. Among the more problematic aspects of this event is that Pope Leo had been dead for three months at 
this point, which was likely known by Humber at the time the excommunication was given. Still, with the permission of the emperor, a response was made with similar attacks towards the Latin practices with a declaration of anathema to all those that had issued the excommunication. These events were very unfortunate, but not the first nor the final dispute between Eastern and Western patriarchs. As the hundreds of years prior have shown, disputes of this kind were not at all uncommon between patriarchs in general of the church over various matters. It is likely that no one would have thought at a time that the Great Schism would, that this would be a lasting event. Following the events of 1054, lay Christians in both the East and the West were likely unaware of the excommunications and generally friendly towards one another. As the Crusades loomed over the horizon, however, the church was approaching a difficult time that would shatter the hope of a united East-West Christendom against the cement, and, and again, and cement the schism. What had previously been only an issue of patriarchs became in the 12th century an issue at the congregational level, where there being disputes and difficulty in the churches of Palestine and Syria between Greeks and Latins. Rome had appointed patriarchs of its own within Jerusalem and Antioch, and the Crusades brought about disputes with, within the congregations. Where, quotes Sir Stephen Runciman, that the Crusaders brought not peace but a sword, and the sword was to sever Christendom, end quote. This separation into two was not the product of one event between patriarchs, rather it is the tragic result of centuries before and after 1054. Although the Crusades would solidify the schism, there, was, there has continued to be, albeit with difficulty, a relationship between the churches of the East and the West. Where quotes from Archbishop of Nicomedia, Nicetas, writing in the 12th century. My dearest brothers, we do not deny to the Roman Church, <laughs> a fruit fly, we do not deny to the Roman Church the primacy amongst the five sister patriarchates, and we recognize her right to the most honorable seat at the Ecumenical Council, but she has separated herself from us by her own deeds, when through pride she assumed a monarchy which does not belong to her office. How shall we accept decrees from her? that have been issued without consulting us and even without our knowledge. If the Roman pontiff, seated on the lofty throne of his own glory, wishes to thunder at us and, so to speak, hurl his mandates at us from on high, and if he wishes to judge us and even to rule over our churches, not taking counsel with us at his own arbitrary pleasure, what kind of brotherhood or even what kind of parenthood can this be? We should be the slaves not the sons of such a church, and the Roman see would not be a pious mother of sons, but a hard and imperious mistress of slaves. The Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire would go on to fall to the Ottomans in the year 1453, and during the preceding century, tensions would remain high between Constantinople and Rome. In 1576, the Orthodox Church would appeal to the Sultan to end the frequent proselytization of Orthodox Christians by the Roman Catholics. Although Constantinople had fallen, the Sultan's move to end proselytization among the Orthodox by the Roman Catholics did help establish the incorporation of the Orthodox Church into the Ottoman state. Today, the Catholic and Orthodox churches have inherited the church whose foundations were laid by these previous patriarchs and the tensions that took centuries to solidify remain today. John Paul II did a great deal of work in the 1990s to create a pro-Orthodox view in Catholics. This work resulted in increased interest from Catholics towards icons, the philokalia, and certain aspects of Orthodox chanting. Many changes have occurred in the world since the formative days of the church in the eastern and western, the east and western parts of the Roman Empire. And while subtle differences have developed in the arguments, the general view of the papacy has remained on both sides. Rome still sees its patriarch, the Pope, in a very different view compared to how the east understands the patriarch of Rome. 
The Orthodox Church does not accept the papal authority doctrine as described in the 1870 Vatican Council. For the Orthodox Church, Rome should hold a place of honor where the Pope would represent a special place of honor. And while the Pope may be the first bishop in the Church, he is first among equals. History may recall 1054 AD as the date of the East-West Schism, but when looking below the most external surface, one realizes that there is a significant and complex history that led to the schism, and that every generation since that time has had some degree of participation in it. This, this schism in a church-wide cir circumstance, this schism is a church-wide circumstance, but at its core, the views of the church toward the Roman papacy has been a common denominator in our long separation. So that was it. That was the end of the paper. And I guess um, I'm going to conclude it there. Um, if you guys have any videos or interesting things you would like to see, let me know in the comment section below. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot um, currently on the docket that I want to make videos about. But I guess I just wanted to kind of touch base with some of you guys and uh uh, post a video and uh, read the paper that I had finished for the St. Macrina course. And that's it for now. You guys take it easy and I'll talk to you in a video coming soon. Hopefully, maybe. <laughs>